Welcome back to JFirst English. I'm Jennifer, and today I'm going to test your listening skills to see how well you can understand fast English and how well you can understand advanced expressions that native speakers use. Are you ready? Let's get started. Here is how this lesson will work. I'll say a sentence three times, and you need to write down exactly what you hear. After, I'll explain. The pronunciation changes that I used in spoken English, and I'll explain what the expression means. Are you ready for your first listening exercise? Get out of here! Get out of here! Get out of here! Did you get this one? I said, "Get out of here." Let's talk about a common reduction: out of, out of. Side by side, you can pronounce as "outa," "outa," get out of here, get out of here. And if you don't feel comfortable using that in your speech, that's fine. But you should understand it because native speakers use it the majority of the time in spoken English. "Outa," get out of here, get out of here. And maybe you understood the words, but did you understand the expression? This might be a trick question because there are actually two totally different meanings for this expression. There's the more literal meaning where I want you to leave the room that I'm currently in. Being here, get out, means leave, leave. Of here, of the room I'm currently in. So I'm recording this video, and my annoying little sister barges in and starts talking. Get out of here. That's what I would say. Now, most likely you're going to say it with a little bit of anger or annoyance. Get out of here. And it's not a very polite expression. So if you politely want to ask someone to leave, don't say "get out of here." You should say, "Would you mind leaving? <laughs> Could you please leave because I need to film a video." "Get out of here" is also used as an expression to show shock or surprise at what someone said. So let's say my friend just told me she's going to move from Chicago to Australia, around the world, and she has lived in Chicago her entire life. To show my surprise or even shock, I could say, "Get out of here! Get out of here!" It's almost like saying, "Really? Wow! I can't believe it! Get out of here! Get out of here!" Now, with this expression, it will be lighter. There won't be that anger or annoyance in it. Get out of here. There'll be more surprise in it. Get out of here. So the meaning will depend on the overall context of the situation, and also look for the tone of voice because that can be very helpful to decide. Our next listening exercise. I'll say it three times. Give me a break. Give me a break. Give me a break. Did you get this one? Give me a break. Pretty easy, right? Did you hear that reduction? Give me, give me, give me, give me. Again, you might not feel comfortable using reductions in your speech, but you should understand them because native speakers use them most of the time. Give me. Give me a break. What does this mean? This is another expression. We use this to express disbelief in what someone says. Let's say I am watching TV late at night and I see an advertisement for a pill that is supposed to help me lose twenty pounds. Overnight, that's what the ad says. If I want to show my distrust or disbelief with this ad, I can say, "Give me a break! Give me a break!" There's no way that's true. Give me a break. 
So that's a fun expression you can use. And remember that tone. You'll want to add some sarcasm into this. Oh, give me a break. Do you want to keep improving your listening skills of fast English? Well, then I want to tell you about the Finally Fluent Academy. This is my premium training program where we study native English speakers on TV, movies, YouTube, and the news so you can improve your listening skills, learn common expressions, and learn advanced grammar as well. Plus, you'll have me as your personal coach. You can look in the description for more information on how to join. Are you ready for another listening exercise? I'll say it three times. My sister will know. My sister will know. My sister will know. I said, my sister will know. Did you hear the verb will? My sister will know. Probably didn't hear it. But maybe based on the grammar, you understood that it has to be there because my sister, no, doesn't make any sense. Something's missing. My sister will know. You probably know that we form subject will contractions. I will go, I'll go, you'll go, he'll go, she'll go, it'll go, will go, they'll go. Those are subject pronoun contractions and they are grammatically correct. Learning contractions is another must when you want to understand native speakers. In this case, a noun phrase, my sister, isn't contracted grammatically. But in spoken English, we combine them together anyway, even though grammatically this isn't done, simply to be able to speak faster and confuse students. But remember, grammatically, we only contract subject pronouns with will. So in your writing, make sure you don't write my sister will as a contraction. But in spoken English, you'll hear it. Another listening exercise. I'll say it three times. You ought to call her. You ought to call her. You ought to call her. Did you get this one? You ought to call her. So here, ought to, a very common reduction, oughta, oughta. Ought to is a modal verb used to express necessity. More commonly, you should call her, but you can also use ought to. You oughta call her. In spoken English, native speakers will say oughta the majority of the time. Now, did you hear call her? Maybe to you it sounded like one word, caller, caller, like a dog caller. That's because we drop the H sound on her and it sounds like er, er. But we also combine it with the previous word, call, er, and then we combine them, caller, caller. Again, based on context, you'll understand that I'm not saying caller like a dog caller, and I'm in fact saying call her. You ought to call her. How about one more listening exercise? I'll say it three times. I had an inkling she'd bail. I had an inkling she'd bail. I had an inkling she'd bail. Oh, did you get this one? I had an inkling she'd bail. She'd bail, she would as a contraction. This is a grammatically correct contraction, she'd bail. I had, had can also be in a contraction with a subject pronoun when it's the auxiliary verb. So if I turn this into the past perfect, I had gone, I can say I'd gone because then had is the auxiliary verb. I'd gone, I'd gone. But here, because it's the main verb, we don't turn it into a contraction. I had an inkling she'd bail. What does it mean she'd bail? Bail? Well, when someone bails, 
This is an expression that's used when someone doesn't do what they said they were going to do. And we specifically use this with plans and arrangements. So let's say I made a plan with my friend to watch a movie on Saturday at seven o'clock. Then Saturday, seven o'clock, no friend. She bailed, she bailed on me. I can't believe she bailed on me again. She didn't do what she said she was going to do. And again, we use this frequently with plans and arrangements. Now what's an inkling? An inkling. I had an inkling she bail. An inkling is a slight indication, a slight hint, a slight suggestion. So something my friend said made me think she was going to bail. Maybe she didn't sound that excited about seeing the movie. Maybe she's been talking about how tired she is. So that's an inkling, an inkling. That's fun to say, an inkling. I had an inkling she'd bail. So how did you do with these listening exercises? Did you enjoy this lesson? Would you like me to make more lessons like this? If you would, then put yes, yes, yes in the comments so I know that you want me to make more lessons just like this. And you can get this free speaking guide where I share six tips on how to speak English fluently and confidently. You can get it from my website right here or look for the link in the description below. And why don't you get started with your next lesson right now? I have an inkling that you'll like it.